In a world where machines have become creative and we design by algorithm, there's only one thing to save the human race. Blow up. Or you could just watch this session. I'm sure that's a much less violent way to do it. So we're going to blow some things up. And the lyrics that you just heard on that rock intro, that hype music to walk me in, um, what if I told you no human ever sang them and no guitarist ever strummed those guitars? That was prompted music. And we are living in a synthetic media reality. We're living in a reality where so much of what we do, hear, see, and experience now is generated by machines, thankfully mostly prompted by humans right now, but more and more of that is going to change. And that is going to change the way that we do the work of the future. So I'm gonna talk a lot about that today. And uh, as you mentioned, my name is Ian Beecraft. I'm the CEO of Signal and & Cypher, and we help companies understand how AI is going to impact the future of their industry and chart a course for what their preferable future is going to be. So when we talk about AI, obviously there hasn't been another single session on it at all this whole time. So, um, we're going to start with some real hype with Alexander Wong saying AI is the holy grail of all technologies. There won't be another technology as transformative. Some of us can go along with this. The most shocking thing that nature ever produced was intelligence of humanity. I'd agree with that. We are now at a precipice of replicating that in silicon. Brave new world. It's starting high. But in a few years, AI is just going to be assumed. We're going to talk about it the same way that we do digital. How many of us talk about digital today as an advantage, the thing you need to be paying attention to? It was at one point. I remember those days. We're in the same moment with AI. But pretty soon, we won't. For, so those of you who have it in your sales deck as we're an AI-powered company, you've got about six weeks for that deck to still matter. And we're in a world where things are moving so incredibly fast. Just a few weeks ago, we had the release of three incredible models all on one day. We had Sora, which blew everybody's minds, and then we had the release of Gemini 1.5, and also VJEPA, which got almost no love, unfortunately, but that was a meta model that was about vision. And all of that happened on the same day, on a Tuesday. Now, that was kind of earth-shaking when it happened. But now it's just a typical Tuesday. And it's going to be a typical Tuesday going forward. On and on and on and on. And we had clues this was coming. We just didn't see them in a lot of different places. This is data from where things uh, were going with archive.org. Archive.org is an amazing place to get information about uh, the research that's happening behind machine intelligence and artificial intelligence. And we saw an exponential rise in the number of studies being posted on Archive around 2021. And as you can tell, the commercialization follows the science. When the science has a tear like that, you can see that people are gonna fall behind, or come behind pretty quickly, you wanna monetize that. And that's exactly what we're experiencing now. We're experiencing the fruits of that effort in the way we're interacting with these models. So to take that exponential bend a little bit harder, um, one of our friends who presented a few days ago, Ray Kurzweil, talks about the law of accelerating returns and essentially saying that these moments of salience become closer and closer and closer together. The gap between major earth-shaking developments closes so fast to the point where eventually we can barely even perceive the difference between one to the next evolution. And one of the challenges of this for us as human beings is that we're not really built to see things exponentially. We are linear human beings. Thinking in exponentials just isn't in our nature. We weren't evolved to think or act that way. So if I walk 30 paces this way, I have a pretty good understanding of where I'm going to end up. I mean, I'm definitely gonna fall off this stage, but I can guess linearly pretty well. What I have a hard time with is, let's say it's not 30 steps linearly, but 30 steps exponentially. Where do I land? Some people would say 
definitely a different room, maybe a different building, different town, some people would say a different state. But 30 paces exponentially would land me on the moon. That is the difference between the stage and a new planetary mission. That is how hard it is to think exponentially, but that's the world we're inhabiting now, where everything seems to be moving at that exponential pace. And that is gonna be informing a lot of what I talk about today in terms of how we adjust our mental models for the work that we are going to be doing on a daily basis. So if we talk about 2050, by the year 2050, we will be experiencing 100 years of progress at the current rate of progress today. So in the year 2024, the rate of progress that I just talked about a moment ago of a typical Tuesday, 100 years of that type of progress every five years. That's gonna be wild. And with that, that exponential change comes a lot of disruption and friction for the companies that we work for and the work that we do. This is called Martek's Law. And Martek's Law states that technology moves exponentially, but organizations and people progress logarithmically. And as you can see, just here, we have a decent level of friction between what's happening with the technological progress and the human progress and the organizational progress. There's this gap in between the two. That tension creates disruption whether from the technology itself or from an outside disruptor, someone can come in and disrupt a particular organization. Now, if you're really good and you're fast and you're agile, you can push that logarithmic curve up a little bit, but you can't outrun it. One example of this is Google. 18 months ago, we had this experimental chatbot pop up that nobody had heard about before, this chat GBT thing. And all of a sudden, Within the last 18 months, Google has now re-engineered its entire product line. As Satya Nadella said, we're going to make them dance. But it's not just Google, it's everybody. This is a harbinger of things to come. It will be for everyone who is going to be playing in this game. And the fun thing to note is that these models are improving with their capabilities and capacity by 5 to 10x per year. So if we take that exponential in mind yet again, we are looking at a minimum of 3,125 times better than they are today, or 100,000 times better than they are today by this date in 2029, five years from today. So if you're looking at imagery and saying, it has a sixth finger, I think it might be able to figure that out when it's 100,000 times better than it is today. Let that sink in, though, because as we interact with these chatbots, these models, imagery, and we're prompting with these things, you might have issues with the state of where it is and think, okay, this isn't working. It'll never get there. The second someone says it'll never get there, come on. The rate of change is so fast and so fast. We've already seen things go from wildly underrated to Sora level quality in just a couple of years. 100,000 times better, that's gonna be a pretty crazy week. Now, the challenge with this though, is AI really isn't that competitive advantage. I talked about this earlier saying, you have six weeks to keep that in your sales deck, and AI is just expected. We don't just need AI, we need a completely new business operating system to be able to accommodate the changes that AI is going to force. This is old adage that we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. AI is doing a pretty darn good job of shaping what we pay attention to. Just look at this room. So if AI is something that we need to be thinking about with the work that we're doing, what are the new models for work and how we're going to be performing that in the future? Well, it's definitely on the mind of a lot of CEOs because 45% of them believe that if things go as they are today, their company won't be viable if it stays on its current path within 10 years. That's pretty shocking. Almost 50% of CEOs think that 
there's a lot to be figured out if they're going to stay a viable going concern. So what this gets to is this idea of business transformation. Digital transformation, business transformation, it's a hot topic. It's something that a lot of consultant companies make a lot of money on. It's something that most companies think they have to do in order to keep up. The challenge is we're now in a cycle where things are moving exponentially. So just doing a discrete session of business transformation isn't enough because by the time you finish, you're already behind again. We're now in an era where regeneration, constant regeneration is necessary not just one moment of transformation. And that changes the framework a little bit of how we go about the work we're gonna be doing. But one of the challenges that we encounter when we're trying to make these changes are that the mental models of yesterday are starting to collide with the technologies of tomorrow. Rashad Tabakawala says it, that the uh, future does not fit the containers of the past. It's beautiful, I love that because it's so true, and yet every time we encounter a new technology, we always treat it with the same frameworks that we did from what we know. Marshall McLuhan says that the new media always imitates the old, and we come to things with a preconceived notion of how they should operate until we find out how they should operate natively. That takes time. That paradigm shift doesn't happen overnight, and we're currently experiencing that. So many companies are coming at AI by saying, just drop it on the tech stack or some magical pixie dust on top of it. We've got AI. And ultimately, like, if you don't work on this, you really don't rise to the level of your expectations. We fall to the level of our systems. And the reason I bring this up is because we need to change the way that we think about work itself if we're going to survive the AI era with our jobs intact. And I personally believe that our systems for work are broken. I think a lot of you probably feel the same way. Many of you probably have been pretty damn burnt out with the work that you've been doing over the last few years. There's more and more and more expected of us every single day, and there's almost no way of keeping up. And it's mostly because a lot of the elements for how we measure success are from a bygone era. Productivity measurements come from the Industrial Revolution. They're meant for outputs and widgets, not human knowledge work. We adapted it for that, and we did a shoddy job at best. So we're gonna take that, not just past the Industrial Revolution, but into the AI revolution and say, we're good? I don't think that's gonna work. So I think you're probably with me on this. I don't think I have to tell you to take the red pill but he better damn do it. Okay, good, he didn't check it out. Let's get started. So we're all on the same page. Um, I personally believe that rather than AI, poor leadership, blind adherence to old systems, and a tech-first mindset are actually a bigger threat to the jobs that we have than AI. The boogeyman of the AI, saying AI is going to come and take your job because it's going to mechanize it, it's going to digitize it, all of a sudden you're no longer relevant. Again, we're talking about the frameworks of the past. If we do nothing and just adopt the technology, yeah, sure, that might be the way it, does, it happens. But there's so much that needs to change about our relationship with work to make this successful. And the problem with so many of these ideas of how this is going to work is it starts with the technology. We're technology first, not framework first, not challenge first. We're not focusing on the problems that we're solving. We're saying, this is really cool, focus on the tech. And you see it in the examples that show up in the news. We asked ChatGPT about the future of our species. We've already deified this thing. We said this is the all-knowing oracle that can teach us so much about ourselves when it's trained on our own data from the internet. We've already seeded. But if you really want to figure out what we can be focusing on that's going to make the difference, the use cases that are really important are things that involve people, opportunities, process, frameworks, constraints. This is where we need to be focusing our time and then saying, once we've figured out how these are optimized, how do we add AI to make it even better? Not 
how do we put the cart before the horse and say, AI is the thing, now everybody adapt around it. But that's exactly how we do digital transformation. When we do a digital installation, we do some sort of technological initiative, we always say, we're gonna install this, IT is gonna spend a year and a half putting this new system in place, and everyone's just gonna have to adapt around it, deal with it. Doesn't work anymore. So how do we do this? Well, ultimately, this new era of work depends on how we see ourselves as workers. How do we see our jobs, the work that we do? And if you take a look at a typical um, organization, this is how that shows up. We have a bunch of different departments, employees that kind of can't go in between departments in their own jobs. The average organization sees an employee as a line item in a specific department that has specific KPIs and measurements. You do this function in this department in this way, and maybe you'll stick around and you'll get a promotion. You don't move in between departments. As you can see, like the idea of department number three, if you're trying to move between, you can't because you have a specific job that fits within a specific place. You have a boss, they oversee you. That's how work goes. Now, everyone has a set of skills within those jobs. Those jobs are built around a set of skills that are required for the functions and the work that we'll do. So that's kind of signified by these dots you see here. And those are gonna play a little bit of a starring role in the next few slides. Now, if we're gonna go beyond just the idea of jobs, let's talk about what it looks like to be a creative generalist. And I'm gonna talk about that concept quite a bit. But each person, essentially themselves, not just the jobs, the jobs require specific skills to get those done, but each person has a set of skills that they bring to the table, and that is kind of contained within this hexagon. But you have a lot of skills you don't put into play in work, at work all the time, because, well, work doesn't ask that of you. You're not required to do that. But I personally believe that this is the era of the creative generalist. And the creative generalist is somebody who isn't just an expert in one domain. They're not just a specialist. We grew up in an era that said, go to school, get a degree, get really good at something, and then build expertise in that particular domain to the point where you can become promotable and have a defensible place in the workforce. And AI kind of throws a wrench in that plan. Because AI allows us to abstract years of discipline, expertise, and effort necessary to perform at a decent level in hundreds of different skills. We've all experienced it. How many of you are absolutely crap at art, but can now use mid-journey to do something pretty cool? That's just with one specific skill set. It's going to happen with practically every skill set you can imagine, abstracting, again, that work and effort necessary to perform proficiently in so many different areas. Now, what that does, and the reason that's interesting from an expertise or a creative generalist perspective, is that all of a sudden, a lot of those skill sets that have been dormant in my job, I can now bring to the table with the power of AI and perform them at a level that can provide value for my organization. It's no longer something that I'm told, don't do that because you're not good enough to do it, or don't do that because our company doesn't need it. Don't do that, it's not your job. That's going to change wildly. And you can see at the edges of this, it says the adjacent possible. Well, these are adjacent possibilities based on skill sets and interests that you might have. A creative generalist isn't just somebody who is, has a depth of expertise in one subject, they have a depth of expertise in multiple subjects, but more importantly, they have a large cross-section of interest, hobbies, expertise, and exposure. And those elements, that is what helps them make connections between the things they're an expert in and the things they're just aware of or good at. If you know what success looks like, at that point, you don't need to have the years and decades of experience to make it so. You simply need to know how to direct the tools and orchestrate the AI to help you make that happen. So a creative generalist, you can see where those edges are with the lines, you've now expanded your skill set and the productive capacity you can bring to the office and bring to your team beyond just that hexagon, which is what was expected of you in the prior era. 
So this looks different for everybody. Person one's adjacent possible looks very different than person two. And all that comes together when you have one person doing adjacent possible work, you have that person growing at a rate that is far beyond linear because they're adding net new skill sets. They're not just improving in a skill set that they bring to work. They're improving in skill sets they hadn't brought to work before. And that's huge. But when you have multiple people doing this, not just one, but two, sometimes three, whole teams, whole companies, all of a sudden you combine those skill sets and the surface area that these people can cover is so much wider. And the capability of these teams becomes massive. Small teams, massive impact. In my little like, group chat with my like, tech CEO friends, there's this, there's this betting pool for the first year that there's a, uh, a one-person billion-dollar company, which would have been like, unimaginable without AI, and now it will happen. One billion dollar, one person company. Now that company will likely look like one person and tens of thousands of bots to make it happen. But the idea of small teams with massive impact, there's a saying in it, uh, going around saying, the small team is now the ultimate flex. How does your small team have an outsized impact? That's a new metric. That fits outside the framework of the typical workflow that we see. We're not all focused on the efficiencies that how can we have a massive outside imp outsized impact as our team? What new capability can you bring to your team in this way? What new value can you bring? That's a new way of essentially bringing metrics that can be measured to the organization that weren't possible before. And when we talk about the future of organizations, the future of organizations will be agent driven essentially driven by bots that can spin up other bots to get actions done. One of the most important skills of the next generation of work is not how do you do a specific type of work. It's how do you orchestrate the resources at your disposal to do the work for you. This is what's called a Haas framework. And a Haas framework is essentially a framework driven around a bot structure that has all sorts of governance built in and it's a bot that can spin up other bots to do specialized types of work. We use this, and it's incredibly powerful at very specific types of work that can be automated across several specialized bots that hand things off to each other. And this kind of is a signal of where things are gonna be going in the work that we do today. Today, there's automation and there's, there are humans that get work done. And automation is seen as a way of reducing headcount, reducing work, and sometimes scaling the amount of work that a small team can do. But the real trifecta of the future of work is teams that are built between humans and AIs interacting together, and automation being a foundational layer underneath that. So I told you these dots were gonna come back. If we're taking a look at created generalists, and what they look like. You saw those dots were kind of uniform before because they were kind of boxed into that really narrow container of what they could do. All of a sudden, as a creative generalist, I've got skills that are enhanced by AI that can fit not just the specific job that I have, but also be lent to other departments based on a specific task or project that might come up. I call this just-in-time skills and expertise on demand. This is something that these bots and these AIs allow you to do. You don't just have to do the work of your own department. Many of us here have had experience with this, just not with AI. During COVID in the lockdown, a lot of companies built up internal gig marketplaces saying, hey, we wanna really leverage the talent we have here. We know that there, are there are people here that have skills outside of the boundaries of the work that they do. Let's bring you in, let's do this together. Well. That was done specifically to make efficiencies based on the things that were demanded of us at that time. That's no longer just a special case. That's every day with AI. Focusing on work that is based on projects and not roles, on skills and not jobs. So if we're gonna kind of break this down a little bit further, we have skills of individual workers, we have automations, and we have things that can be augmented by AI. So now we're starting to see those dots that were there change some colors. And what we have for blue is something that's augmented by AI. Black is stuff that is taken away or abstracted by automation. Now the idea of automating things away 
can be very frightening because people see things that they do automated and all of a sudden feel at threat of having their job taken away. And if you do this within the framework of the way work goes today, of jobs and job holders, instead of skills and tasks and projects, yeah, having something you do automated means there are fewer tasks and things for you to do that are defensible now. And it's eating away at the value that you have in the organization. But if you take a look at it from this type of framework, as a creative generalist, yes, you might have one or two things that are abstracted away from that automation, but look at the other surface area of the impact that you can have, and that just keeps widening and widening. Instead of being in this hierarchical, top-down, constrained system, we are now fluid and moving across departments a ways that the atomic units of work are far more flexible. So, again, when it comes to the work that we do, if we take a look at the traditional structures of work, automation is threatening. But for a creative generalist, that's just the dynamic nature of work. Things are coming up, they're ebbing and flowing, they change, different elements of automation come into play, and then different elements of their skill sets are augmented based on the development of these models and these tools. That changes all the time. Remember, that dynamic change never slows down. So what does this mean? Jobs are dead, but work isn't. It changes the conversation about AI taking away jobs. Yes, I'm not sitting here saying, or standing here saying that it won't take away jobs. It will. But it will take away more jobs in a system that is defined by jobs and job holders, these discrete units, that supposedly can be replaced by these automations. And far less of this will be taking away jobs when we're thinking about people with skills being ma matched with projects and tasks based on their abilities and the augmentation of AI. All of a sudden, so much more adaptable. So what's the secret sauce of a creative generalist? How are they so massively effective with AI? Well, one of the most important things is encoding knowledge, and that is essentially the codification of things like expertise, process, and procedures that can be done and built into things like GPTs, models, and AIs. Many of you have built your own GPTs. That's an example of uh, encoding your knowledge. And we're getting to a point where these generative models are available for individuals enterprise. So I can encode knowledge based on my own skills and expertise, and organizations can do it based on different, certain functions of teams and individuals. All of a sudden, something that might be the domain of a specific expert on a team and locked by its constrained resources is now available across the entire organization and high level skills are available at the edges where the problems are being encountered. So essentially this is knowledge management with applied AI. Knowledge management's not new, but with the power of AI, the scalability and effectiveness is exponentially higher. And Pretty low-key version of this. Many of you have uploaded documents to Anthropic, ChatGPT, and said, hey, help me analyze this. This is something I wrote. Help me understand how these things relate. Now, when you start to scale that to a point where the bots and LMs can read and write, uh, analyze everything you've ever written, all of a sudden, you can start to encode not just what you do, but a decent bit of who you are as well. And we're now at a point where our context windows are getting pretty darn large. With Gemini, it's available at one million tokens, which basically means thousands of documents. And even in the lab, they're able to do it at 10 million tokens. That's absolutely stymieing. So what does this mean for privacy? Well, you can bet that Tim Cook has something to say about that. And the ability to take these models and be able to train them on your work is going to be more and more focused on how we are able to leverage that information rather than giving it to other companies to have it mined like we did our data in the past. Um, and this is important because where Apple's going with their large language model approach is going to be based on privacy. And as more and more of our life becomes codified by the data that we're giving these things, Privacy is going to be super important. 
And ultimately, what this is going to enable us to do is really enhance the ability to build a second brain. Some of you might be familiar with Tiago Forte's concept of building a second brain, which essentially is a repository that helps you manage and ingest, synthesize knowledge that you're interested in. Things that you know and things that you're interested in, whether it's clipping articles, annotating websites, taking notes from podcasts, and making it so you have it available and something you can synthesize at a moment's notice and deploy it creatively. This is being put on steroids with AI. And this is kind of just a diagram of all the different places you can start to pull your information from to ingest it into your own personal knowledge management system. And with this, now with AI, you can start to create content, synthesize information, interrogate it, query it for your own purposes in a myriad ways. And let's give you some examples of what this looks like in application. So this is a niche example of photography being used for this. This is actually from our head of creative technology and innovation, Brent Peterson. And he took his entire photographic library. He is a world-class photographer. He's world, some of the best brands in the world, adventure photographer. And he trained on his whole library. And 1.8 million images to create his own large language model. And with that, he was able to create a little bit of a treat. And that's what he trained it on. Um, so you won't be doing this on your laptop. 1.8 million images, 256 terabytes, four GPUs, six months. Um, but that was last year. And what's amazing about this is you can take something that you have spent a lot of time on, something you have a large amount of data from, and actually even now, you don't have to have it with that much data, and be able to scale that and prompt it and use it creatively. That was pretty cool. It's like an advertisement treatment for a storyboard that's way more high fidelity than the sketches you get in, uh, in preliminary ideation for advertising. And with something like this, he can just prompt it now instead of having to go out and do the photography to make it happen. And this is a very formidable machine. But as we saw earlier, these models are moving at a pace of 10, 5 to 10x improvement. So six months. That same time the year following, which is going to be about six months from now, it takes 10 times less. So six months to 15 days. One more year, 15 days to eight, uh, essentially 30 hours. One more year, we're down to a couple hours. See where I'm going here? That you can probably do on a laptop. It's amazing where we're going. And if you have that kind of computing power, think how good Sora is going to be when you've got billions in computing power. If you think there were quirks with the way we're doing video today, they ain't going to be there for long. Just like that. Think of that. And what this also means is that the more and more you can codify yourself and the work that you do, your colleagues will eventually interact with an AI representation of you. What I mean by this is that you can actually train these models on your likeness, the e emails you've written, the documents you've written, also the work that you're doing so that my agent can actually talk to your agent, have my people talk to your people, and I probably don't have to have a meeting with you. Think about it. Most of the meetings we have, probably 70%, are based on an information asynchronicity, that I have information that I need to give to you that we need to sync on in order to move forward. Now, if my AI knows precisely where I am and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, then that can give it to your AI, that information, and that meeting never has to take place. What would you do with that time back? Well, actually, Microsoft did a study recently, and they show that most of that time would go into deep, focused work, not meetings, not planning. So we're getting to a point where 
the AIs can facilitate a lot of that work, the administrative stuff that gets in the way of deep focused interaction. So, it gets rid of meetings. And the other thing it does is it kind of acts as your assistant in all sorts of different interactions. Love this one. Well, this is your first day joining the company, and we're exciting to uh, let you lead a project from mm -hmm. our customer, right? So this is, a self, this is a healthcare client, and we want you to analyze the patient flow and the operational mm -hmm. process within the hospital. How, what kind of proposal that would, you would think about? And can you share your thought, and then we can discuss? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Let me think about it. Yeah, let me think about it. <clears throat> so based on my experience as a consultant, I will approach the healthcare project. Dude's got deep experience, let me tell you. But as funny as that is, think about that applied to a slightly more honest scenario where it can actually do triage for you, it can actually help assist you in real time with questions that can be of value. What looks like cheating today is just gonna be normal soon. It wasn't long ago that using a calculator was frowned upon, that math teachers actually protested kids using calculators in math class. And eventually they did, and all of a sudden math just got harder, didn't kill math. So yeah, this is the start of something new, and it looks weird, but it is the future. And for the enterprise, it's absolutely a cheat code. I can do the same thing that I did with Brent and his, that Brent did with his imagery and start to do that on the corpus of knowledge within an organization. The brand guidelines, the imagery that we've done, the archival footage and, uh, and uh, documentation, the types of uh, SOPs that we have, and also the information that's in specialist heads to be able to distribute across the team in a way that is scalable. And that's a challenge. It's huge challenge because a lot of that stuff stays within people's heads. What does this solve? Huge things. Like the average employee spending 32 days of the year looking for information to do their job. That is 13% of your payroll wasted. If you're waiting for a use case to apply AI in your organization, especially retrieval augmented generation, there it is. Just saved you 13%, you're welcome. Beyond that though, is it also allows essentially to act as like an API level connection for other vendors and partners. So as a company gets a robust set, uh, setup for this type of AI and trains it on their internal databases, I can use that to empower external partners. So rather than having to enforce certain things are being done, my partners can actually access that API around archival information, brand guidelines, whatever that might be that I'm working with, and that can eliminate an enormous amount of time spent on things like discovery, spent on compliance, because if I'm building a large language model based on my internal knowledge base, it's going to be in bounds with what my company needs to build. So let's go beyond just uh, knowledge and talk about process. He's famous for saying, your margin is my opportunity. And with AI, your process is my opportunity. And this is a really interesting place that causes a lot of tension. We actually played with this um, at Signal and Cypher when we talked about what could it look like to take a business critical process and re-engineer it from scratch. We did this with the brainstorm. We partnered with BCG to essentially analyze how we could start this from scratch. And what we found was there were several principles around why these things didn't work effectively. And rather than just saying, let's power it by AI, we said, let's rebuild this, see what it could look like in a perfect world, and then power it by AI. So we got a bunch of people together. We got 12 innovation leaders uh, in Atlanta from different industries, from railway, logistics, airlines, movie making, you name it. And we said, y'all are gonna come together and you're gonna figure out how generative AI impacts the future of movie making. We chose movie making because that's something that everybody understands, and I don't have to teach you the intricacies of these things. And for one afternoon, we're all gonna ideate together and create a vision of that future. Now the point wasn't supposed to just to fix uh, on movies, but to teach people a new way of doing ideation and brainstorming and design sprints, of course, with generative AI at the center. 
So we talked about using that adjacent possible framework. So we took these people together, split them into separate teams, said you're going to compete against each other as different teams. Magic Kingdom Studios, I think you can figure out who that is, and Mega Media Conglomerates. And you are going to disrupt the industry and plan for the next two years based on what generative AI and trends are going to do with your industry. And with that, they came up with a hypothesis. Each team said, okay, our hypothesis is this. And for them, for Magic Kingdom Studios, it was that generative AI will enable world building at a scale that they've never seen before. So with that, we started to kind of build out a vision for how that could look using one of their IP. Space Wars. Can you figure out what that is? So we started building prototypes of what could it look like to have a Space Wars large language model that anyone could use. So we took tools that already existed, like Blockade Labs, and we created uh, an environment. And then we threw that in Unreal Engine. We dropped a Space Wars trooper into that environment and created a cinematic in 15 minutes. We didn't take six weeks. We didn't take five days. 15 minutes. All of a sudden, something that was an idea, idea, rather than putting it as a sticky on a wall, is visualized in front of you in a way that's visceral. You can respond to it. So we kept building these vignettes of what that world could look like. So being able to enable people with different tools and put yourself into these universes using this technology. This is Wonder Studios, which was a big hit last year. And talk about different business lines and ideas that these companies could get into as a result of these generative models. When large language models can create everything for you, everything's going to be brand safe. Everything will be something that creators can use. And all of a sudden, you have access to millions of new people who can help you build the franchise together. And ultimately, that creates a new class of celebrity creator. And that creates a new cultural relevant event. Rather than just watching the next Netflix of Black Mirror, I want to go experience the new immersive world that a specific celebrity creator has created. So within this time frame, we built a huge set of stories that we were able to visualize, prototype, and build out. And with this new set of uh, process, when we break it down and rebuild it from scratch, it's a completely different experience than just sitting in a room and putting white, uh, squiggles on a whiteboard or stickies on a board for brainstorming. Within this session, there were 4,000 visuals, hundreds of new concepts visualized, built 12 custom landing pages for all the participants, um, two sizzle videos with one six-person design team in two and a half hours. That would have taken weeks for a standard agency model. That's not just because we sprinkled AI on it. It's because we took a look at a process, broke it down to its component parts, and said, how would we rebuild this if we could build it from scratch today? And from there, we started to build diegetic prototypes of what the world could look like that people would experience. So what would it look like to be advertised to in this way? And get an Instagram ad saying, hey, come become an affiliate of this new Magic Kingdom Studios large language model system. And the website that could be built with that IP and licensing in mind. Of course, commercials and concepts. And these diegetic prototypes are essentially ways to teleport somebody into the future that you're trying to telegraph. Most brainstorms, again, are just screenshots of stickies on a wall, rather than something that you can experience and see in front of you. But when you can see a prototype, it allows you to suspend disbelief and push away bias so that all of a sudden, you can sit in that world for a moment and see, ah, I can see how this could come to life. Not, it's never been done that way, we can't do that. So we decided to expand on this and take a look at a full design sprint. What would it look like to put the design sprint on steroids, scale that, and compress it? Well, a five-day design sprint now only takes two days. And instead of five days of work, up to six months. It's not just AI. It's about looking at the process and rebuilding it from scratch and then powering it with AI. And how do we do this? Well, one of the things I was talking about earlier is this agentic workflow. Having bots that spin up other bots that pass things around, what you're actually seeing is an example of that. We use multi-bot ideation to help work things through and interrogate ideas together. What you're seeing on the left side essentially is that chat bot working through the process of, a di of uh, divergence ideation. 
And what's happening on the right-hand side is the spreadsheet in the back that's being populated for each of the bots to hand ideas and content off to each other. So one bot is creating content that then is picked up by another bot based on signals being given across to each other. They're interacting with each other. And this also allows us to be both divergent and create a huge surface area of exploration of ideas, but also go deep in a moment's notice. This is from an example where we had an idea about financial wellness products and said, there's kind of an idea around what if you could talk to your future self and have that guide your decisions. Well, is there any scientific research on that? It happens to be that there is, and it happens to be that there are great tools like Elicit that can help you research and find those scientific studies that actually confirm that information. So either or not you're just building a brainstorm based on gut instinct anymore. You have data in the session that can prove a hypothesis that allows you to build prototypes quickly. So AI is not about automating creativity. It automates process. You can still be immensely creative with the work that you do. And as Signal and Cypher, we believe that the world and the future is powered by people, but enabled by AI. With that, thank you. And uh, before we jump into questions, um, I just have one question for the audience. Onde está a minha família brasileira? Awesome, Baliaro, yes! Muito obrigado por vir. Um, it really means a lot. Did you come my second home? So thank you. So we have a few minutes left for some great questions. Um, the first one that seems to be voted up the most, if billion dollar companies can be run by individuals, how can this new era support jobs for the billions of people on earth? Phenomenal question. So this is really about questions of scale and scarcity. If we are having people in teams that are making billions of dollars based on the current GDP of you know, trillions of dollars, what does that look like to be able to support the world and where it's going? Um, that is a question with enormous depth, and we could probably spend all day here just tracing the edges of it, and it'll take decades for that to play out. And I do believe that we will see teams that reach billions of dollars in value in the near-term future. Um, but just like technology and technology diffusing, that gap will close over time as it becomes the norm. So I think that what we're seeing, for example, Midjourney is an example of a team that at one point was 12 people and did $250 million in revenue in one year. That's huge. I mean, the outsized value is enormous. And that is going to happen more and more. We're seeing it with I mean, Mistral and other uh, AI startups that are getting to massive scale in a short period of time. But again, as that becomes the operating system that is across kind of like the common system, that gap of value, almost that arbitrage, starts to go away and it becomes standard rather than the billions of dollars. What doesn't go away is the outsized value that any individual can have, but what I think will happen ultimately is team sizes will shrink, the idea of a 200,000 person organization doesn't really fit in that world, but the element of hundreds of millions of new solopreneurs having real tangible impact on the world does fit within that framework. Um, let's talk to the next one. Uh, if we become super productive and small teams can have a big impact, should we pass on those productivity games to workers and reduce the day's work per week? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a workaholic, I love what I do, but I can't wait for a two day work week. I mean, that is, it's realistic that in our lifetimes, we will see a four-day work week. The productivity games will be massive. Now, that's not a guarantee. Just because it's possible doesn't mean it's going to happen. We have to fight for it. We have to demand it, and we have to make it what's on the agenda. So ultimately, when, that start, when the benefits start to accrue, they accrue to those who are already in power, the people who are already running the show. But it's something that we have to become a part of the conversation around. So if that's something you want, be loud about it. 
Make it vocal. So yes, that should go back to the workers. Because if you take a look at what's happened with the digital revolution, that did not go to the workers. We found that essentially what digitization did, is it didn't just give power to the masses, it abstracted a certain kind of decision making that also created an entrenched form of power. So there were a lot of people that didn't benefit from that. Now, when you actually push knowledge to the edges and you give people who are at the edges and at the front lines of the organization who are dealing with the problems firsthand, and you give them the power and the tools to solve those challenges, they're no longer beholden to a chain of command that says, I am going to benefit from that. So that changes that power dynamic significantly. What is the responsibility of these billion dollar teams to ensure universal equity, affordable health care, hunger, access to opportunities, not just cash for a powerful view? 100% agree, very much in line with these other questions. Um, I think that these start to change the power dynamic of those who own the resources and those who provide the value. Um, how do you see people in the beginning of their careers being creative generalists? How do they gain repertoire and critical judgment? Um, that's really great, because usually the way is you do the work. You spend the time doing the reps to get familiar with what it takes to be good at something. What is interesting about AI is it allows you to do things at a pace and volume like we've never seen before. We have a saying in, internally that from, virtue, from volume comes virtue. And what we mean by that is, just like in anything else, if you do the reps, you get good at it. But with AI, the number of reps you can do in a short period of time is orders of magnitude larger. The function is different. I might not be the one doing the strokes with the brush or the pencil, but I can get hundreds, thousands, millions of reps in to make this viable and get good at it. That doesn't mean we aren't losing an art form of some sort by doing that. That is going to be a part of the change. We start to lose some of those things that we held dear in the way that we did them in the past. So there will be a negotiation about what is held invaluable. Um, how do you get existing workforce, including management, to adopt mental models required to work in the manner described in your presentation? Great question. Um, work is already starting to move in this general direction when it comes to the idea of skills-based hiring and project-based work rather than jobs and job holders. Um, we, see, we saw a lot of that during the pandemic, and it's probably like the hottest trend in HR conferences right now. And yes, I am the nerdy dude who like watches those on YouTube, because it informs stuff like this. Um, but how do we get them to think about it? Ultimately, the best way is to have, like show them the tangible value they would get by leveraging AI amongst a team in surprising ways. So as an employee, can I show them something that I would do outside of my normal job function using AI, now powered by that. Now the next thing you do is you don't just say, hey, cool, I'm gonna do that for free, you don't have to pay me anymore. You say, hey, how can this be recognized and rewarded? I want to create net new value for the organization, but I also wanna make sure that I capture some of the upside of that value. Um, do you think everything could just start looking the same within organizations with the limit, the unique uh, culture a company has to attract talent? Um, it does already. Like, there are so many organizations that just kind of look the same because they're all following the same playbook. AI doesn't change that. It makes it possible to do things at a scale and a frequency that's impossible otherwise, but that is 100% up to us as to whether it looks the same or whether it does not. That's one of the beautiful things. Is it, AI doesn't take away our agency in that way. And that will always be a uniquely human struggle. How is IP evolving and going to evolve in this scenario? What are the new business models to AI and human collapse? Paulo Brazil, all right. Um, so IP in this, wow. Um, IP is a really tricky thing to na uh, navigate. And I actually realize I'm out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these elements from Slido and I'm going to respond to them on Twitter. So if you have more of these questions, follow me on Twitter, um, and then you'll be able to see those answers there. And with that, thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Cheers. <laughs>